is Aaron. I'm from New Jersey, but I've been living in New York City for the past 17 years, and I think I have a story you might be interested in featuring in one of your videos. So I don't really want to drop this guy's name because I know for a fact that this was a major low point in his life. He definitely isn't a bad guy, just a guy who reached his breaking point one day and just kind of lost it. So that being said, I prefer to keep him anonymous, so I'm just going to call him Dave. Me and Dave were familiar with each other, but not particularly close. Enough that I might, you know, knock on his apartment for to borrow a tool or a cup of sugar or whatever, and we'd say hey to each other if we happened to catch each other on the stairs. So, this one day when Dave knocked on my door, and he actually seemed kind of angry. And when he accused me of talking too loudly, I just straight up was feeling confused. I hadn't been talking at all and the only noises were me cooking dinner while I listened to a podcast on my phone. So I told him that, even showed him inside, and was like, is this the noise you were hearing? Obviously, it wasn't, as the walls that separate our apartments were pretty thick, something you pay a serious premium for in NYC. I knew darn well that it couldn't have been the podcast on my phone, no base to the thing at all, but I still showed him as a demonstration of good faith. He looks all confused, too thanks me then walks back to his apartment after saying something about it probably being the people downstairs. A few days later, same thing happens, only Dave is seriously angry, not just a little peeved. He then accuses me of talking way too loud and not only that, but talking about him behind his back. Saying all this shady stuff about him sounded like it was on the phone to another person too. Again, I told him no, that I hadn't been talking about him and I thought that he was an okay dude and that even if I was talking about him, it wouldn't be negative. He seemed satisfied enough with this, but just as he heads off to his apartment, grumbling about terrible neighbors, I ask if I can come over to his apartment to see if I can hear where the talking is coming from. He says sure, and I walk over, fully expecting to help him solve the mystery of the loud neighbors. But then, when I walk into the TV room in his apartment, it's quiet as the grave. Like, you could have seriously heard a mouse fart in there. I then asked him the dreaded question, if he could still hear the people talking, and he just turns and looks at me to say, You can't hear that? He then puts an ear right up to the wall connecting to my apartment, nods and says, I can still hear it coming from the wall. It has to be those downstairs neighbors. You know, I already told them one by one, and they're still taking me for a complete idiot. As you can probably guess... I put my ear to the wall and heard absolutely nothing. And that's about the point that I realized that something was going horribly wrong with Dave's mental health. I tried to suggest that to him in the most delicate way possible, in a way that would seem both respectful and concerned, but good God if he didn't just totally explode on me, saying, you think I'm crazy? Well, F you, buddy. Get the F out of my apartment, you gaslighting mother effer. Quote, unquote. I legitimately thought that he was about to knock my teeth out as I edged back towards the door. He was so angry that by the time I was out in the hallway, his eyes were bulging and there was froth literally coming from his mouth. I mean, he looked like he was about to blow a gasket or something. After he slammed the door in my face, I walked back to my apartment and started googling what to do if your neighbor is having a mental breakdown. Turns out you can get, I guess, a crisis team to come out to visit people if they're showing signs of hurting themselves or others but that seemed like the nuclear option at that point. Like I didn't want to have the men in white coats show up for the guy, and that seemed like such an extreme solution to something that might pass within a day or two if he just had some time to relax or whatever. It took less than 48 hours for the whole thing to blow up, and when it did, it was bad. It was the middle of the night when I woke up to the front door of my apartment getting pounded on and before I can even ask what was going on, I hear Dave's voice like, Open the door, you piece of trash. I told you what would happen if you talked about me again. Well, now you're dead. And he's screaming this. He hadn't told me anything. We literally hadn't spoken since the day he threw me out of his apartment. Whatever little interaction he'd had had either been with someone else or it had occurred entirely inside his head. I remember rushing back to my laptop and bringing up that NYC Crisis Emergency Service website and then feeling my stomach drop as I saw they only took calls between 8am and 8pm. I knew if I actually called the cops it'd probably turn out really, really bad. 
If they showed up and Dave rushed them, he might end up getting shot. Even getting tased and beaten would be bad enough and I'd feel terrible about that. But then, as I looked over at my apartment door, hearing Dave screaming about how he was going to kill me while the door was literally shaking on its hinges, I realized I didn't really have any other choice. I tried one time to reason with him, told him I called 911 and if he didn't stop hammering on my door like he was, but he literally screamed back at me, Call them! It's you who will take away in cuffs, you mother effer! And I swear to God, his voice sounded different. He was so detached from reality by that point that he legitimately thought that he could get me arrested for something. So when I told him I was on the phone to 911 asking for any kind of mental health assistance, he went right back to his apartment and called them himself. I know that because about 15 minutes into the call, the operator named him first and second name and told their dispatch center had just received a complaint against me, coming from a guy that sounded completely out of control. They sent the cops out that night, but Dave somehow managed to act normal enough for them to leave without arresting him for anything. They also knocked on my apartment too though, which is how I gave them the lowdown on everything that had been happening. He didn't get any serious help until later that day when the mental health team knocked over to talk to him about his behavior. I swear to God those people were a literal godsend, and I have no idea how they did it but they managed to just convince him into coming with them to get checked into somewhere for a few days so he could get some medication. They left his apartment door open when they were talking to him and I was leaning my head out into the hallway to listen in on what was going on. I only have a faint idea of what was said, but as they were leaving, Dave was in tears. I told him I was sorry for having to call the cops, but that I needed to get him some help and he was just crying like a baby saying, I know dude, I'm sorry too. I just shut my apartment door when they were gone, and I'd be lying if I said I didn't shed a tear too. It was just an awful thing seeing someone all broken down like that. I didn't go visit him in the hospital, and I didn't think it was my place to do something like that. Besides, he had an ex-wife and a kid who still cared about him enough to go visit, as well as a few brothers and sisters who brought him food and other home comforts. I only found out what actually happened when he came back a month later and I went over to check on him to see if he was okay. Turns out he'd had a friend pass from cancer at home and he'd been one of the two people going over to make sure that he was as comfortable as possible. Guy couldn't afford the hospital bills as he had no savings or insurance so this 40-something dude just had to lie in bed at home, racked with pain until his body finally just gave up and died. Dave and this other caregiver had been there at the time and he said that he couldn't sleep for days afterwards. Not long after that, he started hearing voices in the walls and, well, the rest you guys know already. I suppose I want to make clear that this isn't just a scary thing that happened to me. There's kind of a lesson to it too. If you know of someone whose mental health appears to be suffering in some way, like seriously on a steep descent, then do not hesitate in contacting someone. I should have called that crisis team the moment it became clear that Dave was hearing things that weren't really there, but I hesitated, and that could have been a fatal mistake. Either Dave could have hurt himself, or he could have hurt me or one of our neighbors, and because I was one of the few people to notice what was going on, I think I'd have had to shoulder some of the blame for anything that occurred. I'd like to live in a world where we all take care of each other a little more, and it's not just physical health that's important. Anyways, thanks for reading and I hope it wasn't too much of a bummer towards the end. I just wanted people to understand that Dave wasn't a bad guy at all. He'd just gone through a traumatic experience that I honestly think would drive most people crazy. I just hope people can learn from this indirectly so that if someone in their lives needs help, they can be the person that gets them the assistance they need before it's too late. So, I go to this comedy club in NYC called The Stand, and a few years back something happened that was literally anything but funny. This one week, these two comedians had a roast battle, which is basically just two guys saying a bunch of mean but funny stuff about each other in front of the audience. Generally, whoever makes the audience laugh the most wins around, and 
Then it's whoever has the most points out of five rounds is the winner. This one guy wins by definitely a mile, and the other guy is joking about how he's going to get him back, stuff like that, how they should have a rematch the next week. The club actually books it, and since it was such a good roast battle, pretty much the exact same audience and more show up for the show the following week. The way the club is set up, there's no backstage or whatever, so the comedians just sit at the bar in a little closed-off area until they're ready to do their sets, and then they literally have to walk through the crowd to get to the stage. So it looked like the guy who lost the roast battle hadn't showed up, and when this gets announced, everyone is groaning, disappointed that they weren't going to see the rematch, so instead, the winner gets invited up just to do a normal set. Then, as he's walking to the stage, some guy who had been sitting in the audience in a hoodie stands up real fast, pulls a gun from his pants, and just fires a shot at the guy who then hits the floor hard. People freaked out. They started running for the exits, screaming and crying. Some people tackle the shooter whilst others run to see if the comedian's okay. Then as I look around because I'm in the process of running myself, I see the comedian suddenly up on his feet and he just looks like Sorry, is the only way I can think to describe it. Then the shooter, the guy in the hoodie, has already pulled his hood down and it's the dude who lost the roast battle. Basically, they'd come up with an idea to fake a shooting to make it look like the loser wanted some serious revenge. Only I can't think of a dumber prank to pull in a packed comedy club like that. I mean, it was like shouting fire in a crowded theater thing, you know? People could have actually died from people getting crushed, and I think we're actually lucky that it didn't go down like that. The comedian had to rush onto the stage and get on the mic to say stuff like that it was a prank, people. Everyone calm down. It's just a prank. It's not a real gun. The guy had used a fake, but it was some kind of firecracker to make the noise and all that stuff. I mean, I'm not 100% sure how he did it, but it was convincing enough to scare the life out of almost everyone in the club. Both people were banned from performing there, and I think the fake shooter actually got a visit from the cops afterward for inciting a panic or something of that nature. It wasn't funny at all, obviously. It was one of the scariest things I've ever been a part of. Back in the late 70s, I was 18 years old and I was still living with my mom and dad down in Kentucky. I'd always been different, and it was something that myself and my parents had always been aware of, but around the age of 18, I realized why I felt so different to the rest of the people in my small country town. Right around that time, most of my friends were chasing girls, and had given up on pretty much everything else except to pursue more hormonal inclinations. But me, I never had any interest in girls. I always felt more attracted to my male friends, and for the longest time I thought it was just that something was wrong with me. But then, the more liberated society became, and more people talked about queerness, the more I realized that they were actually talking about me. So instead of living a lie, I decided to face my truth and to share it with those close to me. So, in 1977, I decided to tell my mom, dad, and sister that I was gay. It did not go well. We were a conservative Christian family who lives in the Bible Belt and not only were my parents outraged that I dared succumb to such sinful desires, but they told me that as long as I wanted to live like that, that I wasn't welcome in their home. So, what choice did I have other than to pack up and move somewhere that would actually accept me for who I was? That was how I decided on New York City. It took me about a month or two to properly orient myself to the gay scene here, but in the end, I started hanging out at a few different places that made me feel more and more at home. For a young gay man, New York City was like a paradise back then. Yeah, there were ignorant people, but there are ignorant people everywhere. But in NYC, most people just didn't care, were too busy to care about stuff like that, and I can't tell you how liberating it was. But over the years that followed me moving there, the paradise I'd found became more like a living hell. And to a lot of us, it was like there was some deadly phantom stalking me and my friends. A demon that stalked us, found us, and killed us, one by one. 
I remember it started with a friend of mine who was named Patsy. Patsy's real name was Patrick, and he felt much more comfortable using his drag name, Patsy, as it made him feel much more like herself, so to speak. Patsy used to join us for drinks at the Black Rabbit most Friday nights, and occasionally he'd show up in drag to sing in the karaoke shows. Those were some of the most amazing, hilarious nights of my life, and Patsy really knew how to work a crowd. But then this one Friday, Patsy didn't show up, and Patsy always showed up to Friday night drinks. We were all pretty concerned for him, but it made sense when somebody closer to him than we were mentioned that he wasn't feeling like himself lately. There was a pretty nasty cold going around at the time, so we figured that he picked it up and was feeling under the weather. Then, the next Friday, he didn't show up again for Friday night drinks, and he wasn't the only one. A few more of the guys closest to Patsy weren't showing up at their regular haunts, and nobody could get a hold of them to find out what was going on. We eventually found where Patsy lived after talking to a club manager who had given him a part-time job. He had an address from his old copy of his payroll. We didn't know exactly what was going on at that time, and some of us actually thought that he might be depressed after a breakup or something, that it was some kind of mental health crisis and that all Patsy needed was a little love, and he'd be back to his usual self. We couldn't have been more wrong. By the time we went to visit Patsy at his apartment, it was about six weeks since he first dropped off. Me and a friend of mine went over to his place only to find a moving truck outside. We didn't think anything of it at first, until we got up to Patsy's apartment and saw that the moving guys were in the process of emptying his apartment. His landlord was supervising the whole thing, so we asked what was going on and if he knew where Patsy was. That's when he tells us that Patsy's in the hospital, and that he hadn't paid rent in like two months, so he was moving all of his stuff into storage and would be sending Patsy the bill. All he knew was he was in the hospital, and he didn't know which hospital, so we set about calling up almost every hospital in the city just to find him. It took days, but eventually we found the place where Patsy was staying at. When we asked what was wrong with him, the nurse said that she couldn't tell us, but that we were free to visit during visiting hours so we could talk to him. We'd missed the allotted time slot for that day, so me and the friend that had helped me find Patsy agreed to meet up at Beth Israel the next day so we could go visit Patsy. But I don't think that we could have ever been ready for what we saw. When we walked into the room, we barely recognized the man we saw. Patsy was always a little plumper than most, probably because of his unapologetic love of pasta due to his Italian heritage. But the man we saw when we walked into that hospital room was little more than a skeleton. Patsy was wasting away in that hospital bed, and he was so weak that he could barely talk. We all just broke down crying without even really saying a word to each other, and I'll never forget how the tears pulled in Patsy's sunken eye sockets before they actually started rolling down his cheeks. We went back almost every day for almost a week, until one day we showed up and the nurse told us that we weren't permitted to visit with him anymore. We asked why, the nurse told us that Patsy had some kind of infectious disease and that it was too dangerous to sit with him unless we wore proper protective clothing. We insisted on it, that we didn't mind taking the risk and we'd wear anything they'd asked us to in order to be able to visit him. They made us wear full gowns, gloves, a mask, a hairnet, like full surgeon's clothing just to be in the same room as him. Then one day, we went in to see Patsy and we were told that he passed away in the night. There were lots of us in NYC at the time, much like myself, who had moved there because we didn't have anyone else. We had no family, none that wanted to know us anyway, and it was exactly the same with Patsy. We found out that no one was coming to claim his body or organize a funeral or burial for him, so if we wanted to have any kind of memorial, it was down to us to do it. Of course, we knew it was the right thing to do, and we knew Patsy had enough friends to pack out a church or a memorial hall or something. Only, that's how we found out how bad this whole thing was getting, when we organized a funeral and next to nobody showed up. It wasn't that he wasn't popular. It was a combination of two things. The first was that more and more of us were coming down with whatever horrifying disease that had taken Patsy, and the second was that so little was known about it that people honestly thought that they could just catch it from being in the same room as his dead body. 
And then there was all the prejudice and bigotry that surrounded what they called grids at the time. It stood for something like gay-related immunodeficiency syndrome or something. Like they still thought it was specific just to gay people, and even regular non-bigoted people just ate that up since it was coming from the scientific community. Over the years that followed, we were almost completely abandoned by everyone who had once supported us in our lifestyle choices. Me and the friend I was close to stopped dating completely since we were eventually told that it was spread through having intimacy. That was a weird relief to us because at least we knew how to avoid catching it by then, and as much as it was awful having to put our dating lives on hold, anything was better than dying in such a horrifying way. Things got better over the years, and I personally took part in a lot of activism to be able to spread the truth about grids until it was finally reclassified with the name it's known as today, AIDS. That felt like a real victory, for people to know the truth about it and how even straight people could catch it if they weren't careful about drug use and safe contraception, all that kind of stuff. Then it wasn't just something that only gay men could get. It wasn't God's punishment, as so many evil bigots had said. We were all in it together, all united in fighting such a terrifying and insidious disease. When the likes of Freddie Mercury died from AIDS, as well as Easy e from the NWA rap group, that's when things started to get much better for us. Those were sad, sad deaths, and the gay community was devastated, especially for Freddie. But I remember being left with the impression that a lot of people didn't have to die, and that if they'd only listened to us instead of just dismissing our claims, that a lot more people would have been spared such horrible deaths. It's a time in my life that I'm still haunted by today. A time when it was like an invisible killer was stalking through our tight little community. So many of us had run away from getting hurt, beatings, and death, and it was like death had followed us. I don't know why that it got to be me that survived when so many of my adopted family didn't. I don't think I was doing anything different at the time and I suppose it just comes down to luck that I was sleeping with certain people and not others. I still feel guilt, a lot of guilt, that people like Patsy, who used to light up the rooms that he was singing in, had to die, while I got to carry on living in the shadow of one of the most terrifying diseases the world has ever known. Back when I first moved up to New York, the fumes from the traffic outside made my asthma come back with a vengeance. I ended up going to a doctor and he said that I didn't have to worry anymore because he had this top-of-the-line asthma medication that would completely rid me of my symptoms. I was over the moon when he told me that, as I was having a really rough time, like couldn't sleep and stuff because of it. So I got the prescription, hit up a local pharmacy for the pills, then got home and took like three of them immediately so I could finally get some decent sleep. I take the pills, take a shower, grab a bite to eat, and then I head to bed and read a book until my lungs untighten and I start to feel sleepy. I remember turning my lamp off before I settled down to go to sleep, and the last thing I did was cuddle my cat and be like, finally, we can get some sleep, don't it? From memory, this would have been maybe 10.30 at night, so... It was still relatively early, especially by Brooklyn standards. Then at maybe 1.30 in the morning, I woke up, still with nice clear lungs, but when I opened my eyes, I saw a short, dark shape standing in the middle of my bedroom. I immediately shot up out of bed, switched on the lamp on my bedside table, and got ready to either kick whoever's butt or run screaming from the room. But when the light lit up the room, there was absolutely nothing there. It looked like it could have been a kid. It was that short, but then it was also way too bulky to be a kid. It looked like a smaller version of a large, muscular grown man. Needless to say, I was seriously unsettled by what I saw, or what I thought I saw, and the whole thing basically ruined any chance I had at a decent night's sleep as I was absolutely terrified to see that thing again. I only really fell back asleep as I saw the dawn start to break outside and then about an hour later, I had to be up for work. The next day, I was terrified. Talking to my friends in a group chat, but they just thought that it was hilarious. Telling me that there's no such things as ghosts and whatnot, and that I must have just imagined the whole thing. 
When I saw on my grandma's grave that not a word of what I was saying was a lie, they just carried on making fun of me, telling me to get an exorcist and all this nonsense, and that if I was going to make up a ghost story, at least make it spooky. But I wasn't making anything up. I didn't believe in the supernatural or anything like that, but what I experienced had me seriously questioning whether I'd been right to just assume it was all nonsense. Because what else explained what I saw and how quickly it disappeared? When they finally started to believe me, one suggested I'd been experiencing some kind of sleep paralysis. They had a cousin that had gone through a literal nightmare of a time dealing with a condition that made it feel like there was some kind of demon in the room with them at night, and they couldn't do a single thing to stop it because they couldn't move. Only, that didn't make sense because the moment I saw the shape of the thing, I jumped up and turned my light on to see if anything was there, which is right when the thing just seemed to completely disappear. That's when my buddy starts getting seriously concerned for me. I think he finally started to appreciate that I wasn't just making stuff up. After that, he actually starts trying to help me figure it all out, and we go through a ton of different medical conditions and stuff before he finally asked me if I'm on drugs. He meant like actual illegal drugs or whatever, but that's when it hit me. I was on a new medication for my asthma, and the medication was singular. I grabbed the box, took out the little piece of paper on the inside, then started reading through the side effects. That's how I found out that in some cases, your first few doses can cause waking dreams around your sleeping hours, like brief hallucinations that are basically just dreams bleeding over into reality. It was such a relief knowing wasn't going crazy, and even more of a relief knowing that nothing remotely supernatural was going on, because I can't even describe how terrifying of a concept that was to me. I'd grown up not believing in anything like that, and that sudden but false realization that spirits, demons, whatever you want to call them, were real. That's a feeling of terror that I don't think I'll ever forget. So just a little warning out there. Be careful with Singular, because as much as it did a great job in ridding me of my asthma symptoms, I went right back to using my inhaler. No, it wasn't nearly as effective, and I still had a lot of trouble sleeping for a while until I finally moved to a less air-polluted city. But it was way, way better than suffering from hallucinations, especially scary ones in the middle of the night. During the summer of 1977, New York City experienced the most intense heat waves of its long and fabled history. Temperatures peaked on July 21st at a blistering 104 degrees, and the sweltering temperatures became ingrained on the city's collective psyche. But for many, the heat isn't the only thing they remember about the summer of 77, because that same year, the streets of the Big Apple were stalked by one of the most deranged and merciless killers the city has ever known. The murders this person committed were wrapped up in a parcel of mental illness, depravity, and devil worship. And the name he gave himself was one that would strike fear into the hearts of New Yorkers for a generation. That name was Son of Sam. A year earlier, in the early hours of July 29th, 18-year-old Donna Loria and her 19-year-old friend Jody Valenti were sitting in Valenti's Oldsmobile in the Pelham Bay area of the Bronx. They had each spent the night at New Rochelle's Peach Trees, a popular disco venue in the area, and were engaged in a playful discussion regarding some boys they had spoken to that evening. It's believed that they were parked just outside Donna's Pelham Bay home, and when the conversation was over, Donna opened up the passenger side door with the intention of climbing out of the car. Yet as she did so, she was suddenly startled when she spotted a man who appeared to be approaching the car at a rapid pace. According to Jody Valenti, Donna found this sudden intrusion to be very irritating and said aloud, Now what is this? Those proved to be her final words, and as almost as soon as she spoke, the strange man produced a pistol from a brown paper bag, aimed it with both hands, and opened fire. The first bullet ripped through Donna's skull, killing her instantly while the second struck Jody in her left thigh. Then just as suddenly as he had appeared, the gunman turned and disappeared. Thankfully, Jody Valenti survived the gunshot wound, 
and later described her friend's killer to investigating homicide detectives. She told them that he was a white male in his early 30s who appeared to be around 5 foot 8 and 200 pounds with dark curly hair. Frighteningly, this description was echoed by Donna Loria's father, who told police that he had spotted a man sitting in a yellow compact car that was parked near to his home on the very same night his daughter was shot. The Loria's neighbors also confirmed a similar-looking vehicle had been cruising the neighborhood that night, as if the driver was searching for a particular person. Three months later, 20-year-old Carl Donaro and his 18-year-old girlfriend Rosemary Keenan were sitting in the car in the Queen's neighborhood of Flushing when one of the windows suddenly exploded inward. As they sped away, the couple didn't even realize that someone had been shooting at them despite the fact that Carl was bleeding from a bullet wound to his head. He later said he believed it had been caused by flying glass and was stunned when he realized that if the bullet had traveled just a few inches to the left, his brains might have been blown out. Just a month after that, teenagers Donna Damasi and Joanna Lamino were walking home from a midnight movie showing when a man in military-style fatigues approached them. They later told police that he began to ask them directions in a high-pitched voice. It suddenly stopped talking as he produced a revolver and opened fire. Each girl was shot once before their attacker fled the scene and Neighbors later said that they witnessed a blonde man running away from the scene of the shooting with a revolver in his left hand. Miraculously, both girls survived the shooting, but Joanne Lamino was left paralyzed as a result of ballistic damage to her spine. Two more shootings occurred in January and March of 1977, with each resulting in a single fatality, and the string of attack had left the panic-stricken citizenry of New York City demanding answers. This resulting in an NYPD press conference being held on March 10th of 1977, where it was officially announced that the same 44 Bulldog revolver had been used in each of the shootings. To their infinite horror, New Yorkers learned that a serial killer was stalking the streets of their beloved city, but they had no idea the intensity of the terrifying sequence of events that were about to unfold. Just after 3 a.m. on April 17th, college-age couple Valentina Seriani and Alexander Esau were sitting in their car on the Hutchinson River Parkway service road in the Bronx. They were just a few blocks away from the Loria Valenti shooting when four bullets ripped through the frame of the vehicle. Both were shot in the head and tragically, both would lose their lives as a result of the shooting. New Yorkers were horrified, but not nearly as horrified as they would be when they learned of the handwritten letter that was found near the victim's bodies. It was written mostly in black capitals and was addressed to the NYPD captain Joseph Borelli, and despite attempts to keep the letter's contents a secret, a number of excerpts were subsequently leaked to reporters. Some of it read as follows, and some listeners may find it to be extremely disturbing. I am the son of Sam, and I am a monster. Sam loves to drink blood. Go out and kill, commands Father Sam. Behind our house, some rest. Mostly young, their blood drained, just bones now. I am on a different wavelength than everyone else, programmed to kill, and to stop me, you must kill me. I am the monster. I am Beelzebub. I love to hunt. I live for the hunt. Prowling the streets looking for fair game, tasty meat. Let me haunt you with these words. I'll be back. I'll be back. Bang, bang, bang. Yours in murder, Mr. Monster. Media outlets consulted scores of psychologists who noted that the killer seemed to gain a great deal of gratification from eluding law enforcement. Police then released a psychological profile of their suspect who was described as most probably suffering from an intense form of paranoid schizophrenia, which in turn manifested itself in the belief that they were a victim of demonic possession. Just over a month after the handwritten letters were discovered next to the bodies of Alexander Isal and Valentina Suriani, Daily News columnist Jimmy Breslin received a handwritten letter from someone who claimed to be the son of Sam. On the envelope, neatly hand-printed in four precisely centered letters were the words, Blood and Family, Darkness and Death, Absolute Depravity, 44, some of the letter reads as follows. 
below from the gutters of NYC, which are filled with dog manure, vomit, stale wine, urine, and blood. Hello from the sewers of NYC, which swallow up these delicacies when they are washed away by the sweeper trucks. Hello from the cracks in the sidewalks of NYC, and from the ants that dwell in these cracks and feed in the dried blood of the dead that has settled into the cracks. The killer then addressed Jimmy Breslin himself with a line, JB, I'm just dropping you a line to let you know that I appreciate your interest in those recent and horrendous 44 killings. But, you can forget about me if you like, because I don't care for publicity. However, you must not forget Donna Loria. She was a very sweet girl, but Sam's a thirsty lad, and he won't let me stop killing until he gets his fill of blood. I am like a spirit roaming the night, thirsty, hungry, seldom stopping to rest, anxious to please Sam. The letter's author signed it simply son of Sam, and underneath the sign-off was a series of several symbols. The author also included the moniker, the Wicked King Wicker, which furthered law enforcement's belief that the killer held a fascination with the occult. As a result, the NYPD arranged a private screening of the 1973 occult horror movie, The Wicker Man, and encouraged its homicide detectives to attend. A week later, the New York Daily News published the letter and Jimmy Breslin personally urged the killer to surrender himself. The edition of the paper which included the latter article became the highest selling edition in the Daily News history, with over a million copies being sold all over the tri-state area. What had once been a panic among New Yorkers turned into a frenzy, and some took certain steps in order to avoid becoming victims themselves. It was noted that all the shooting victims to date had long, dark hair, and in response, thousands of New York females cut their hair short and applied brightly colored dyes, with some even purchasing blonde wigs in the hopes of avoiding the killer's attention. The demand was so great that there was a mass shortage of wigs in the city, and businesses that were in possession of them ramped up the price to make a quick buck, much to the ire of the general public. June of 1977 saw Son of Sam return to his grisly work when Sal Lupo and his girlfriend Judy Placido were shot at close range in a nightclub parking lot just before 3 in the morning. Thankfully, both victims survived their wounds, but one of Son of Sam's next victims would not be so lucky. Just two days after the one-year anniversary of the first shootings, Stacy Moskowitz and Robert Violante were sitting in the latter's car parked under a street light near a city park in the neighborhood of Bath Beach. They were on the first date, and romance was very much in the air, so much so that they were completely unaware of a man approaching the passenger side of the vehicle. The man fired four bullets into the car, striking both Stacy Moskowitz and Robert Violante in the head before fleeing the scene. Robert was blinded in his left eye as a result of the attack, while sadly, Stacy passed away as a result of her injuries. Moskowitz's passing marked the sixth Son of Sam murder in just over a year, and New York City had been driven half mad with fear and suspicion. But it was that same suspicion along with excellent police work that finally brought the Son of Sam to justice. Given that two murders had occurred in the Pelham Bay area of the Bronx, parking was temporarily forbidden in an area of almost five square blocks, and any car that lingered too long was investigated and ticketed. This is how a 1970 four-door yellow Ford Galaxy came to the police's attention, and they noted with grim interest that it matched the description of the car that was in Donna Loria's neighborhood on the night that she was killed. When the police contacted New York's Department of Motor Vehicles, they discovered the vehicle was registered to a one Mr. David Berkowitz, who lived up in Yonkers. The next day, police investigated Berkowitz's car, which was parked on the street outside his apartment building. It was then that they spotted a revolver in the back seat, and after searching the car, they also found a duffel bag filled with ammunition, maps of the crime scenes, and a threatening letter addressed to Inspector Timothy Dowd of the Omega Task Force. After that, it was clear. Berkowitz was the son of Sam. All they needed was an arrest and a confession. But given how dangerously violent the son of Sam was, 
police decided to wait for Berkowitz to leave the apartment rather than risk a violent encounter in the building's narrow hallway. They also needed to wait until a search warrant for the apartment could be properly obtained, as officers were terrified that their search might be challenged in court and that the infamous killer they'd long searched for would subsequently slip through their fingers. When Bergowitz exited the apartment building at about 10 p.m., a detective, John Falatico, approached the driver's side of his car and pointed his gun close to Berkowitz's temple, all while Detective Sergeant William Gardella pointed his gun from the passenger side. It's then that Berkowitz smiled, looked up at Detective Falatico, and said, Well, you got me. Now that I've got you, Detective Falatico responded, Who have I got? You know, Berkowitz said in what Falatico remembered as a sweet, almost childlike voice. No, I don't. Tell me, he replied. Berkowitz, still smiling, simply replied, My name is David Berkowitz, and I am the son of Sam. Upon searching Berkowitz's apartment, police officers discovered it was covered in satanic graffiti. They also found diaries that he had kept since he was 21 years old, in which Berkowitz had meticulously noted hundreds of arsons that he claimed to have set throughout New York City. Some sources speculate that this number might be over 1,400. Just after 1 a.m. on the morning of August 11, 1977, Mayor Abraham Beam was visibly relieved as he announced to the media that the people of the city of New York can rest easy because of the fact that the police have captured a man whom they believe to be the son of Sam. All it took was 30 minutes of interrogation before Berkowitz confessed to the shootings and expressed an interest in pleading guilty. Berkowitz then made the outrageous and infamous claim that his neighbor's dog was one of the reasons that he killed, stating that the dog was possessed by an ancient demon and that it demanded the blood of pretty young girls. A few weeks after his arrest, Berkowitz sent a letter to the New York Post in which he repeated his original story of demonic possession, yet toward the end of it, he made an extremely chilling claim. There are other sons out there, he wrote. God help the world. Finally, on June 12th of 1978, David Richard Berkowitz was handed six consecutive life sentences to be served in Attica Correctional Facility in upstate New York's Supermax prison. But that wasn't the end of Berkowitz's story, because as he'd made it clear, there are other sons out there and once he was locked up, he was determined to prove that he wasn't the only killer that had stalked the streets of New York during that long, hot summer. In the year that followed his incarceration, Berkowitz mailed a book about witchcraft to a police department in North Dakota. He had highlighted several of the book's passages and had written notes in the margins, including Arliss Perry, hunted, stalked, and slain, followed to California Stanford University. This was in reference to the murder of 19-year-old Arliss Perry, who had been killed at Stanford on October 12, 1974. Even more horrifying was the fact that her corpse had been mutilated in the Stanford campus chapel, with Berkowitz claiming that not only was this a deliberate act of Satan worship, but that he had, had personally communicated with Arliss's killer. Berkowitz went on to claim that he had killed at the behest of a satanic cult that he had joined in the spring of 1975, and stunned the general public when he claimed that he was only guilty of the murders of Donna Loria, Alexander Esau, and Valentina Suriani. He asserted that several other cult members were involved in every incident by planning the events, providing early surveillance of the victims, and acting as lookouts and drivers at the crime scene. Yet when asked to provide the names of his accomplices, he claimed that he wouldn't be able to without putting his family's lives at risk. At this point, Berkowitz seemed to make a very convincing assertion, and that was how some victims had only survived because a female cult member was unfamiliar with the powerful recoil of a 44 bulldog. This negatively affected her accuracy, which in turn saved the lives of Carl DeNaro and Rosemary Keenan. Despite the feasibility of such a claim, Berkowitz's assertions were dismissed by many of those close to the case, one of which was the recipient of one of his letters, Jimmy Breslin. Breslin rejected his story of satanic cult accomplices, stating that when they talked to David Berkowitz that night, 
He recalled everything step by step by step. The guy has a thousand percent recall and that's it. He's the guy and there's nothing else to look at. Former FBI profiler John E. Douglas, who spent hours interviewing Berkowitz, also expressed his skepticism. He argued that David was an introverted loner, incapable of being involved in group activity. NYPD psychologist Dr. Harvey Schlossberg also stated that he believes the satanic cult claims are nothing but a fantasy concocted by Berkowitz to absolve himself of the crimes, and lacks any serious credibility. In the decades that followed David Berkowitz's arrest and incarceration, the Son of Sam killings remained some of the most notorious serial murders in world history. Not just for their brutality and insane motives, but for the fear they struck in the hearts of innocent New Yorkers all over the city. Berkowitz himself continues to express remorse on Christian websites, having taken up evangelical Christianity in an attempt to save his soul. But if there is anything resembling a just God that casts judgment on us when we die, then I've no doubt whatsoever that David Berkowitz is destined to burn in hell. Hey Joel, found your channel a few weeks back and I have a story for you. I used to live in this apartment building in Queens, New York City and this one time, some nice lady invited us to an apartment warming when she moved into our building. It was pretty cool. It was nice to meet some of the people in my building that I'd never spoken to in all the years I'd been there and it was only a handful of people with some bottles of wine so it wasn't too crazy. But then at one point, right when everyone is talking, we just hear the scream that sounded like it came from down this lady's hallway near her bathroom. Me and this other guy went to investigate thinking someone from the party had gotten hurt or something, but then realized that not only were the bathroom and bedroom empty, but no one from the party was actually missing. We're just kind of like, so if it wasn't one of us, who screamed? It was way too loud and clear to have come from another apartment, but there was no one there when we went to look which was instantly after we'd heard it. It totally killed the mood of the party and we all left not long after with the lady who just moved in being kind of scared to be alone. I would be too. She moved a little while after too and the apartment had stayed empty ever since. I'm not saying that I live in a haunted apartment building or anything like that. I'm not a person who believes in the ghosts or ghoulies or anything, but something bad definitely happened in that apartment that night. I just don't know what. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear about all these stories and big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends, and remember, your mom knits socks that smell.